Bloomberg, the War and Peace Report. We are broadcasting live from Copenhagen, uh, from inside the Bella Center, where thousands of delegates from over 190 countries are gathering for the largest climate summit in history. Over the next two weeks, so 100 world leaders are expected to attend the UN conference that has been described by some scientists as the most important the world has ever seen. We begin today, though, 300 miles away from here in Copenhagen, in the Norwegian capital of Oslo. That's where President Barack Obama has received the Nobel Peace Prize, the award ceremony coming less than two weeks after President Obama ordered a major escalation of the war in Afghanistan. In a possible attempt to avoid questions about the Afghan war, the White House has canceled the traditional press conference held for the Nobel Peace Prize winners. In addition, the White House has canceled other events held every year, including a dinner with the Norwegian Nobel Committee, a television interview, appearances at a children's event promoting peace, as well as a visit to an exhibition in his honor at the Nobel Peace Center. We're going to go right now live to President Obama's Nobel acceptance speech. Modernity. It perhaps comes as no surprise that people fear the loss of what they cherish in their particular identities, their, their race, their tribe, and perhaps most powerfully, their religion. In some places, this fear has led to conflict. At times, it even feels like we're moving backwards. We see it in the Middle East as the conflict between Arabs and Jews seems to harden. We see it in nations that are torn asunder by tribal lines. And most dangerously, we see it in the way that religion is used to justify the murder of innocents by those who have distorted and defiled the great religion of Islam and who attacked my country from Afghanistan. These extremists are not the first to kill in the name of God. The cruelties of the Crusades are amply recorded. But they remind us that no holy war can ever be a just war. For if you truly believe that you are carrying out divine will, then there is no need for restraint, no need to spare the pregnant mother, or the medic, or the Red Cross worker, or even a person of one's own faith. Such a warped view of religion is not just incompatible with the concept of peace, but I believe it's incompatible with the very purpose of faith. For the one rule that lies at the heart of every major religion is that we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Adhering to this law of love has always been the core struggle of human nature. For we are fallible. We make mistakes and fall victim to the temptations of pride and power and sometimes evil. Even those of us with the best of intentions will at times fail to right the wrongs before us. But we do not have to think that human nature is perfect for us to still believe that the human condition can be perfected. We do not have to live in an idealized world to still reach for those ideals that will make it a better place. The nonviolence practiced by men like Gandhi and King may not have been practical or possible in every circumstance, but the love that they preached, their fundamental faith in human progress, that must always be the North Star that guides us on our journey. For if we lose that faith, if we dismiss it as silly or naive, if we divorce it from the decisions that we make on issues of war and peace, then we lose what's best about humanity. We lose our sense of possibility. We lose our moral compass. Like generations have before us, we must reject that future. As Dr. King said at this occasion so many years ago, I refuse to accept despair as the final response to the ambiguities of history. I refuse to accept the idea that the 
isness of man's present condition makes him morally incapable of reaching up for the eternal oughtness that forever confronts him. Let us reach for the world that ought to be, that spark of the divine that still steers within each of our souls. Somewhere today, in the here and now, in the world as it is, a soldier sees he's outgunned but stands firm to keep the peace. Somewhere today, in this world, a young protester awaits the brutality of her government but has the courage to march on. Somewhere today, a mother facing punishing poverty still takes the time to teach her child, scrapes together what few coins she has to send that child to school, because she believes that a cruel world still has a place for that child's dreams. Let us live by their example. We can acknowledge that oppression will always be with us and still strive for justice. We can admit the intractability of deprivation and still strive for dignity. Clear-eyed, we can understand that there will be war and still strive for peace. We can do that, for that is the story of human progress. That's the hope of all the world. And at this moment of challenge, that must be our work here on Earth. Thank you very much. The excerpt we have just played is the live excerpt of that speech as he was concluding. We'll play more of the speech and also speak with a longtime South African activist about the significance of not only President Obama receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, but what's happening 300 miles away right here in Copenhagen, what some are calling the most important uh, diplomatic meeting in history. This is Climate Countdown. Stay with us. Så tårerne, de triller, der i stuerne Åh oh, ja yeah. Midt om natten Midt om natten Det næste, der skete, tør jeg ikke at tænke på Midt om natten En fyr, vi kaldte Spacey, tog den ud i det blå Midt om natten This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. 
It is Climate Countdown. We're broadcasting from Copenhagen. Meanwhile, 300 miles away, President Obama has just delivered.